at last our discussion of Morgoth's ring, which has been interrupted. So I know that everyone who is uh, watching or listening to this asynchronously won't notice any difference. But for those of uh, you guys who have been following along live with the class, it's been a month uh, since our last session. So uh, and here we left off right in the middle of the debate of the Valar. I was uh, I was so sad. I was hoping to finish the debate uh, before I had my hiatus and then something came up and I couldn't. Um, but anyway, really excited to jump back in. Uh, so uh, 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 delighted to be back. I've been looking forward. Uh, this might be the broadcast I've been most looking forward to getting back into, mostly especially because we left it in such a cliffhanger position. Uh, sort of. I mean, not that, you know, the debate among the Valar is exactly the most, you know, dramatically suspenseful thing Tolkien ever wrote. That's not really my point. Um, but, uh, uh, but of course, it's I uh, have found this uh, extremely gripping, uh, seeing how Tolkien is resolving these ideas. And not only that, but also developing the characters uh, of the uh, of the Valar as well. Uh, as we go through. So, yeah, Josiah says we've been simulating over the last month. Uh, we've been simulating time in the halls of waiting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, Josiah, I guess that means it's probably good for us, right? Uh, <laughs> that it's 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 hopefully going to uh, going to serve, uh, you know, to instruct and correct us uh, so we can at least only hope so. Um, exactly. Yeah, Christopher, it's, I, I, I agreed. We're receiving correct. Um, <laughs> so, so we'll see. Um, okay. Uh, before we start, two announcements of very imminent and very important things. Some of you will have heard these from me last night, uh, but uh, for those, especially for those of you who haven't, uh, I, I, I want to make two big important announcements uh, because they're for fairly major events that are both coming up quite soon now. All of a sudden. Uh, the first is for our Humanities Summit. Signum University is hosting a summit on the future of the humanities, of, of the teaching of the humanities. Uh, and we're doing this for two reasons. First, because uh, we at Signum are really concerned about the crisis in the, in the humanities right now. There's, of course, a large crisis in all of higher education right now, uh, but it's going to be something which is... Um, uh, uh, this is something which affects the humanity somewhat disproportionately as in an attempt uh, to stay afloat, a lot of higher education institutions are jettisoning their humanities departments as if they were uh, extra cargo weighing down the ship. And that's not okay. Uh, we need a different approach to teaching the humanities. Uh, so Signum University is looking to... Uh, expand just as we've done in small ways, like with our Germanic philology program, uh, another discipline which is in decline everywhere else around the world, and yet we are uh, it's a, a growing and thriving uh, field of study at Signum University. Um, so we want to invest in the humanities. We think the humanities are very, very worth teaching. Um, but again, clearly, some things need to be done as far as rethinking our overall approach to teaching the humanities. So uh, our our interest in this, Signum University is is planning uh, to open an undergraduate hum, uh, humanities program. We we are this is this is our plan. This has been our plan now for a little while. Um, one of the first stages of doing this is we are seeking the collaboration and the wisdom of our colleagues uh, in in the humanities. We want to get together and we want to talk about what would an innovative new program in the humanities look like. I've got some ideas, right? We have some ideas at Signum uh, for our own program, but we want to get together and we want to think through what are uh, uh, what what should humanities instruction look like in the 21st century, given the realities of 21st century education and 21st century and the 21st century sort of job market and the whole direction in which higher education is going. What can we do? What can we do to do it best? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Michael, this is one of the interesting questions. Michael is asking, you know, what I uh, uh, do I include foreign language in the definition of the humanities? I would include language instruction uh, within uh, the humanities, um, though the question of like where we draw the lines, right, and exactly what we define as humanities and not humanities. Well, that's one of the things we're going to be discussing, of course, uh, uh, during our summit. Anyway, so uh, the 
the, the sort of the immediate outcomes of this uh, of this event that we're holding. We want to get together with other people who uh, who who teach and study the humanities, uh, and we want to pool ideas. This is not going to be like a conference where people are giving presentations. This is going to be like a discussion. We're all going to be rolling up our sleeves, uh, 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 discussing and working through various issues of like the principles of humanities programs and uh, some of the mechanics of what mecha- of, of how we should implement uh, some of these principles in, in actual programs. Um, f- as a result of this, we hope to publish uh, a concept paper for what we think are you know some of the key things that we think are really important for the humanities in the 21st century. But of course, course, also, we at Signum are then going to be taking, you know, f- from this discussion, ideas which we are then looking soon thereafter, as soon as we can, uh, to embody uh, in our new humanities program. So it's a really exciting time. That is That summit meeting is coming up very soon. That is this Saturday, just a few days from now. So Saturday, July 25th uh, is the date for our summit. Um, so I wanted to strongly encourage anybody who uh, either would like to be involved in that discussion themselves or who would, uh, who knows somebody else who would. The, the conference is completely... Uh, is completely free to attend. We're not charging anybody for the conference. Um, we do ask that you send us a, just a letter of interest in your CV. Um, just, again, so that we can... Uh, there are several things that we need to be able to sort of figure and sort out um, in thinking about sessions and everything. Um, so if you're interested, send, send a statement of interest to humanities at signumu.org. Uh, so that's the email you should send, again, just to send a statement of interest and in your CV... Uh, and uh, that's and then we'll be in touch. Uh, so that's what's that's what's going to happen. Um, Matt argues that we should include physics labs. That seems unlikely, Matt. I got I to gotta tell you, I think that, I think that one's a long shot. I think that one's a long shot. Um, yeah. So um, okay. <laughs> um, uh, cool. All right. <laughs> John Moss suggests maybe a metaphysics lab. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, we have a number of people, I think, who would be interested in seeing a metaphysics lab uh, <laughs> as part of the new Signum program. Um, but um, anyway, OK, um, uh, so anyway, yeah. So please, again, humanities at signumu.org. Let us know if you would be interested. Um, we are hoping to make our proceedings available in some ways. Uh, Chris, we haven't sorted that out yet, but um, uh, we'll see what we can do. So, and at the very least, we're going to be publishing our proceedings, as I say. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. I'm not quite sure about that yet. Um, okay, uh, so that's one thing. One thing is the Humanity Summit coming up this Saturday, the 25th. So uh, please do uh, uh, get statements of interest uh, in about that. The second uh, event is Myth Moot. It is almost Myth Moot. Myth Moot has already been postponed. And of course, as you have probably heard by now, uh, we did end up feeling that we had to make the decision uh, to make Myth Moot an entirely remote and digital experience this year. I'm very disappointed by this, but I think it's necessary. But however, despite the fact that I am disappointed uh, that I'm not going to get to see folks this year, I think that this is going to be a really awesome event. Our events team has been working really hard here at Signum uh, to be uh, doing as much as we can to recreate the MythMoot experience for folks. Uh, and so in the interest of that, we have, int- we have introduced a new level of registration to MythMoot, um, which um, is going to be really cool. So you guys will remember that we had the MootCast uh, registration level last time, which, w- which enabled people to uh, attend both live and also to get archived recordings of each of our paper sessions and everything so people could watch the presentations and and even to some extent be involved, uh, you know, ask questions and stuff if they were able to attend live and, and, and things like that. So that was really good. That worked super well last year uh, and I thought was a really good experience that we were able to make available for folks who couldn't make it to Myth Moot last year. We still have that. We still have the Mootcast um, I think. And again, that's it's kind of more passive in a sense that is you, you can you can sort of see what's happening in the presentation sessions you can uh, get the recordings afterwards but you're not really sort of fully involved I mean we we knew that you know with mootcast we couldn't make people fully involved um, but we have now another 
uh, uh, registration layer that we have added specially for this year, which we call Moot Hub. And that is our digital, full digital experience, because not only um, one thing I did not want is I didn't want to see Myth Moot, you know, a, a sort of remote Myth Moot uh, simply become you know, a day of like people giving talks, you know, or a couple days of people giving talks, you know, basically just broadcasting a series of like online symposia of the kind that we always do. It's not that that wouldn't be awesome because it would be awesome and we'd still get people's really cool papers and stuff and you'd still get to hear talks from awesome folks like Verlin Flieger and Tom Shippey and Amy Sturgis, but we're not... Um, but it wouldn't be anything like the Myth Mood experience, right? Because, of course, being at Myth Mood is so much more than just being able to attend the talks. Uh, it's also the opportunity to, like, meet and connect with folks who are also there. It's the opportunity to not only, you know, maybe hang around after the talk and, and ask Verlin Flieger a question after her talk, but maybe, you know, sit down at lunch with her at her table the next day. You know, th those are the kinds of things that, re and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, sitting at the fire pits at two o'clock in the morning, you know, later on uh, that night. Those are the kinds of things that make Myth Moot really, really wonderful. Uh, and we're attempting uh, to recreate that as much as we can. There's going to be a lot of uh, really cool stuff happening. We're still going to have like our merch center. We're still you know, not just Signum merch, but some of our uh, uh, some of our community folks are going to be presenting uh, 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 really cool things for sale. We're going to have the room of requirement. We're going to have uh, opportunities for having uh, uh, you know a more sort of informal you know uh, Q and A and talk, just like you you know uh, ran into Verwin Flieger in the back of the room in between sessions and were able to you know have some uh, give and take and questions with her and those kinds of things are we're going to we're going to try to make that happen uh as much as possible so um that's um going to be really fun i'm really looking forward to that so that is that is the moot hub registration level the moot cast registration level is just it's, it still exists we're still doing that so that because especially for people who can't actually you know the the, the moot hub experience is really going to be for people who can experience it live right you know if you're basically you would be ready to come for those four days and so you're you're, you're able to just kind of you know, be engaged uh, during those four days with all of these live things. A lot of that, like the social stuff, is not going to be recorded. Um, so that's going to be just sort of part of that experience during the dates, which I should mention are August 6th through 9th. Um, if you can't do that, you know, if you're not really able to, I mean, if you, you, you're, you just, you have conflicts or something during those days and what you really want is just to be able to access the main talks and to be able to get, uh, to access to the recordings, to the ones that you can't see live. We still have that option, uh, for people who are really only able to participate kind of passively. Uh, so the mootcast option, uh, still does, uh, exist, uh, for that reason. So, um, Anyway, that's um, that's where we are. Uh, so there's Moot Hub and there's Mootcast. If you had enrolled in Mootcast previously and you want to upgrade to Moot Hub, we have uh, an option for that. Go to signumuniversity.org, scroll down a little bit, and you'll see uh, on our events uh, pane you'll see little links to uh, the to the Myth Moot page where you can get all the registration links and stuff uh, and upgrade links and things like that. Um, uh, but you can also get, uh, you also see the link to the Humanity Summit, which has a full Q&A that we did about the Humanity Summit and everything so that you can, um, you can understand all that uh, more clearly. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Excellent. I think I remembered. Sorry, I'm checking my list. I think I remembered uh, all the things. Um, I'm sorry. I'm double checking something here because I've got a this other thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, I am pretty sure. Yes. Good. That I remembered the things I'm supposed to announce. Any questions uh, about that? Um, okay. Good. Let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, oh, Tomas wants to know, how do we work out the costume party? Oh, yeah, that's happening, too. Um, uh, 
we're going to do some synchronous and some asynchronous entries into the costume uh, contest. Yeah, yeah, no, the, we didn't want to lose the costume contest. Uh, uh, so, uh, oh man, which reminds me. Yeah, I got to figure out my costume for this year. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, yeah, no, that's still that's still definitely happening. Happening. Um, yeah, okay, it is going to be mostly asynchronous, uh, submitting photos or videos, and then we'll do we'll do sort of a show of those, uh, like we do, you know, our sort of. Uh, costume uh party event but there will still be like the costume party and the judging and stuff uh and the prizes uh so that's still going to be that that's that that's that's going to be fun um yes yana we're not going to be able to do a city tour where i have to pronounce street names in dutch uh that is of course not uh going to be if it's one of the things that that we lose um and uh you know and sadly of course it's going to be a while i think before our regional moot program is able to resume on schedule you know we had so many fun things planned which we've had to put off uh i mean goodness i was you know our original plans called for me to do three international moots uh within the next uh, uh within the next two months um uh one in canada one in uh japan and one in uh the uk but um uh, I don't think we're going to be able to do any of those as planned because, of course, <laughs> I can't travel to any one of those three countries right now. Uh, so anyway, it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be um, we'll we'll figure things we'll figure things out. Um, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, uh more on that kind of thing as we move forward. We're still sort of feeling our way forward with our moot program as a whole. Um, but myth moot this year is going to be really great. As I say, our team is doing a wonderful job of, uh, uh, making that a really immersive experience. Uh, so I am, I am psyched for this. I'm, I'm, uh, really looking forward to myth moot this year and I am, uh, delighted, uh, that they have, created this opportunity uh our events team has been able to create this opportunity for us to be able to have something which i think is going to be at least close uh to the myth mood experience it's not going to be the same uh but i think it's going to be pretty awesome um yeah yeah oh yeah at, at uh, sharon's telling me we're, we're even doing our uh our our, our pub trivia uh uh uh, uh, uh team competition and stuff it's going to be uh it's going to be cool. Yeah, that's going to open. Uh, it's going to open the weekend before. Yes. And actually, in some ways, the whole myth. One of the results is that the whole myth mood experience is going to be kind of extended a little beyond the four days, I think, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, so anyhow. All right. So those are my two announcements. Sorry for taking a while with those. But those are uh, both, as I say, very important announcements, which um, uh, are both coming up very soon, because, again, the Humanity Summit, the 25th of July, just this coming weekend. And then Myth Moot is from the 6th to the 9th of August, just, you know, less than two weeks uh, from now. Um, no, just a little over. Yeah. Wait. Yes. Just a little over two weeks uh, from now, two weeks from tomorrow. So uh, anyway, very both coming up very soon. Let us return uh, to Morgoth's Ring, which I know there are some who, even before we had our month-long hiatus, were beginning to think that uh, I was shifting, you know, I, I, sort of succumbing to the temptation uh, to gravitate to an exploring the Lord of the Rings approach to Morgoth's Ring. I know that that's a, an accusation that's kind of hard for me to rebut at this point because I have been and I'm going to shamelessly continue uh, uh, moving very slowly through the text here at this at this stage of the text. Um, but um, but it is not true. Uh, and we will be uh, picking up speed again soon. But this is a moment that is worth lingering over, I think, um, not only because uh, we see here. In, and, and by here, of course, I mean the debate of the Valar over the uh, the the uh, Finway and Muriel issue. But uh, um, it's worth it's worth lingering over not only uh, because this is a a, a, a a passage of text. This is going to happen, uh, you know, during the latter portions of our discussions of uh, of the history of Middle Earth when we get to bits which are part of Tolkien's later thinking, which did not make it into the published Silmarillion. And there are several of those, 
right? Um, as we know, uh, as we've talked about before, when Christopher made his editorial decisions in publishing The Silmarillion, he tended, you know, he, he had the big decision between do I include my father's latest thoughts? In which case, if I do, in order to do that, I'm going to have to write a lot of it myself because it's not in a finished form that can be integrated in to the Silmarillion, or do I choose instead to include the most complete versions of the texts so that the published Silmarillion can include to the greatest degree uh, possible stuff all written by J.R.R. Tolkien himself. That's a huge editorial decision, and either way would, in a sense, be really defensible, right? Or to put it negatively, there are real downsides to both, right? In either case, you're going to lose something and you're going to lose something really important. Um, so it's really kind of an unenviable uh, position that Christopher found himself in. This is in some ways not really a standard kind of editorial uh, <clears throat> uh, dilemma that he found himself in. Um and of course, we know that he chose the latter route. He chose the most complete texts and therefore tended to go back to the earlier stuff rather than integrating the later stuff, um, which means as we begin to go through this later stuff, we are going to come across lots of ideas and passages of text which are not in the published Silmarillion and are therefore going to be even more new and even more... I find in some ways strikingly rewarding discussion and close examination, even then like those fun, wacky passages in the Book of Lost Tales, which are like his older ideas that he later abandoned. Right. I mean, those are uh, sort of fun and interesting and, and sometimes kind of shocking enough. Right. Um, but I find these um, I find these even more um, uh, even more powerful in some ways, uh, especially when, as certainly has been the case now uh, in, uh, in Morgoth's Ring, we are also able to see most clearly, I think, Tolkien's mind at work, his, his, the big decisions that he's making, right? Seeing him work through some of these larger questions. Uh, and in some ways, again, this is Another reason why I find this stuff even more uh, even more compelling than I find the earlier stuff. Again, not because I think it's better, you know, that like these are better stories than the Book of Lost Tales or something like that. Um, but again, more ritually rewarding, careful discussion uh, because we see him wrestling with really deep concepts here. There are things that we can learn about. Tolkien's whole like mindset, right? Of you know the 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 things which emerge from the Lord of the Rings, the things which, uh, uh, which are both derived from the process of writing the Lord of the Rings and which were the consequences of having written the Lord of the Rings. Um, this is stuff. And there's, there's really almost no parallel to, to, to this kind of, uh, uh, of big picture world building, uh, decisions that we see Tolkien making. Uh, we get almost no parallel to that in the early, uh, in the early, earlier work. Um, but, um, okay, good. Let's see. Um, <laughs> you know, Caden says, what would be wrong with exploring the history of middle earth? Well, you know, um, Caden, you ask that because you're young. <laughs> if you were my age, <laughs> you would, and I, and I know I'm not ancient, but, uh, uh, but, but even at my age, exploring the history of middle earth, uh, begins to sound like a daunting, uh, I mean, goodness, I'm still, you know, rolling the dice as to whether or not I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to live through exploring the Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah, um, Good. Yeah, exactly. Josiah, that is a task for the young. Indeed. Uh, absolutely. Um, OK. Um, yeah, no, Yana, you're absolutely right. We are not going to um, speed through the Athrobeth. Absolutely not. Um, so uh, Jocelyn was asking, can I give an estimate as to when we'll get to our next book, which is Dante, uh, which is the Inferno? No, <laughs> I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, cause we do have the Athrobeth and, um, 
not positive how long that's going to take us. October? That's my guess. I'm going to guess October is when we'll get to Dante. Um, yeah. I would not at all be shocked by two more months uh, on Morgoth's Ring. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, see, you guys were guessing too. Halloween. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's... Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer Pope says soon. Yeah, exactly. In the sense of calling all time soon, uh, I assume there, Jennifer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Josiah thinks we're shooting for Advent at this point. Maybe. I think we might finish before Advent. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's... Um, Let's get back into it. So I want to, at, at the risk of slowing down even further, I wanted to do a little bit of a recap um, because we're, we uh, we did break off sort of in the middle. So I'm going to try to, th this is, okay, I'm going to time myself. All right, go. We began looking at the bait, at the debate, looking at Aule's first statement, right? When he comes essentially to the defense of Feanor. Um, but the important thing about his argument here is that basically he blames the death of Muriel on Iluvatar, right? He says, look, you know, you can say art is marred, whatever, but uh, if the birth of, if the greatness of Feanor is the direct cause of Muriel's death, then that was Iluvatar's call, right? He is the one who is in charge of, you know, administering the, you know, of, of uh, dishing out the Fea, right? The, 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 the Fea to each one of the elves who are born. Uh, and so if he gave Feanor this Fea, okay, it wasn't Muriel's fault. Um, and if that led to her, so, you know, how can we, uh, how can we understand this? He, he we, we saw him being resistant to the idea that um, this tragedy was a result of their choices, of the marring of the Noldor themselves. And in especial, he was resistant to the idea that there's some kind of shadow on Feanor, right? That he, like, in his birth, caused his mother's death and that, therefore, there's something sort of intrinsically ominous um, uh, about that. Um, um, Olmo then responds and says, death for the Eldar is an evil, right? Which must proceed from the marring, right? So he's like, you can't, you can't ignore the fact that Artemard is involved here, right? Yes, the coming of Feanor must proceed from the will of Eru, as he says, but the marring of his birth comes of the shadow and is a portent of evils to come. We have to, we have to confront this. Right. Um, have a care, thinking not that the shadow is gone forever, though it is beaten down. Yavanna responds, disagreeing with her husband. Right. Disag excuse me, her spouse. Right. Disagreeing with her spouse, Aule, and saying he errs in that he speaks of Finway and Muriel as being free in heart and thought from the shadow, as if that proved that not that befell them could have could come from the shadow or from the marring of Arda. Right. She says they don't have to be We, in order to acknowledge that Melkor's marring of Arda was involved in this situation. We don't have to conclude from that, that therefore the Noldor are corrupt. Right. Um, she says the substance of Arda itself is corrupt. Everything about Arda. She said, you know, she reminds everybody that Melkor had as great a role as any of the others of the Valar in the shaping of Middle-earth, and he marred everything that he touched. And so, therefore, inasmuch as uh, the Hroa of the Elves comes from the very Hron of Arda, which has been marred, this marring is built in to the system from the beginning. So, again, it doesn't have to mean... The tragedy that happened doesn't have to be an indictment on Muriel and Finway, necessarily. Um, but marring is definitely uh, involved. So she says, the failing of the strength of the body of Muriel may then be ascribed with some reason to the evil of Arda Mard and her death be a thing unnatural. And that this should appear in Amman seemeth to me as to Olmo 
a sign to be heeded. That is to say, a sign of uh, of evil. Right. Um, then we ended with Nienna's speech, right, which was kind of amazing that she spoke um, and her speech was complicated. Um, she was speaking of the fair, the 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 fair of the children in general. And she emphasized two things. First, that their fair are very strong in themselves. So she speaks of each fair of the children. She says, for it hath the strength of its for it hath the strength of its singleness impregnable. In its nakedness, it is obdurate beyond all power that ye have to move it if it will not. So on the one hand, they cannot be swayed beyond, uh, apart from their own wills. They are in their wills very strong. Their choices are free choices. But that doesn't make them mighty. Because although they have this impregnable singleness of themselves. Their wills cannot be simply uh, taken over uh, in in itself, right? They cannot be the the fea in its the the fea in its nakedness is obdurate beyond all power. She says to move it if it will not. But that doesn't mean that they're mighty. That doesn't mean that they're undefeatable. That doesn't mean that they're uh, incorruptible. Because they're little, and they can affect little, and they're young, and they know time only. They, the problem is, they're ignorant. Their minds are as the hands of, of their babes, little in grasp, and even that grasp is yet unfilled. How shall they perceive the ends of deeds, or forego the desires which arise from their very nature? The indwelling of the spirit in the body, which is their right condition. So the fair in itself is obdurate and strong, but the fair and the hroa together, the, the framework of the actual life and life experiences of an elf makes them vulnerable. Uh, and she ends with an appeal to compassion, essentially. Um, have ye known the weariness of Muriel, or felt the bereavement of Finway? It's easy for the Valar to sit back and think about these absolute issues and try to judge what is right and what is wrong and what they should have done or what they should not have done. And Nienna says, look, I have, she, it's a big surprise, Nienna feels pity for them, right? Um, and she urges pity towards them and their situation. They, given their framework, given what they know and don't know, um, given the, uh, the, the, the desires which arise from their very nature, the, uh, the, that nature which is the indwelling of the spirit in the body, um, given the desires that arise from that and their lack of understanding of the consequences of their action, uh, because remember, they don't know that much and they're constricted within time. They don't have any memory of timelessness. It's okay to say, like Aule was suggesting, that the spirits, uh, you know, the, the, the Fear of the elves come from beyond Arda, just like the Valar did, right? Um, and so therefore, he said, the causes of, the, of this whole situation came from beyond Arda, right? Um, she says, yeah, we can say that, but they don't have any memory of, they don't have any consciousness of that, right? They have only ever known a temporal existence, and that's super limiting, Right. Um, so. Uh, anyway, that's. Um, so this so here that that's Nina's response. Sorry, I just lost one of my windows here. Restoring my little window there. OK, good. All right. Um, OK, so that's my. Um, synopsis of where we'd got in the debate uh, so far. Um, yeah, now David says, uh, David Atley says that Nienna implies that the Valar do indeed perceive the ends of their deeds, and that shines a rather new light on her plea for clemency toward Melkor. Perhaps, David, though I'm not sure, well, we will see even later in this very debate that it is not true that the Valar see all ends, right? We know that they don't know 
everything that is going to come. They might be in a better position than the Eldar are to perceive the ends of deeds. Um, especially since, as Nianna says, they have the, ti- the, con- the context of timelessness, right? They do have the memory of the timeless existence before their descent into Arda to kind of contextualize things, um, which helps. But they still have opinions. Um, they still have opinions. Um, and that... Um, and often their opinions are wrong. So it's not that that they have full knowledge of the ends of deeds. Uh, that, I think, is uh, is important to remember. Um, but they can certainly make a better stab at it than, uh, uh, than the Eldar can, for sure. Um, yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Hang on, uh, Stephen. I'm looking for the place that you're talking about the use of the verb effect with an E. Uh, where are we? Oh, yes. In life, they are little and can effect little. Yes, good. Um, not affect with an A. That is an important difference, right? Affect with an A means influence, right? Uh, that they can, if she said they can affect little with an A, she would be saying they can have little impact on events. That is certainly not true, right? But they can effect little. Uh, to effect something as a verb means to bring something else to be. That's a cause and effect verb, right? If you effect something, then that means you cause it, essentially. Uh, it means to bring about a particular result. That is what the Eldar have small power to do. They might want to bring about certain effects. They might choose to work towards certain goals, but they will often fail of those goals. Things will rarely work out just how they want them to be. Um, if you have a great power to effect things with an E, that means bringing about results is in your power, is in your control. And they don't have that, she says. So yeah, that's a really, that, that's a really uh, interesting uh, and illustrative little point there. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah, good. Let's see. Um, okay, hang on. There's a couple of questions that I want to come back to. Let's um, let's move on to the next argument because we're nearing a turning point in the argument, uh, and that is Olmo's second speech, which is a long one. Olmo answered her saying, so he's answering to Nienna, saying, Nay, though I do not condemn, yet still I will judge. So he is resisting her saying, look, how can we, how can we say? Uh, have you experienced what Furiel and, and Furiel, not, not yet, what Muriel and Finway say, uh, ha, have experienced? How can we judge that? And almost says, no, 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 no. No, we can. We can judge. I, though I do not condemn, yet still I will judge. Um, we can apply our faculties to understanding the situation, even if we haven't experienced it. Herein I perceive not only the direct will of Eru, but fault in his creatures. Not guilt, yet a failing from the highest, which is the hope of which the king hath spoken. And I doubt not that the taking of the higher road, an ascent that, though hard, was not impossible, was part of that purpose of immediate good, of which Nienna speaketh. For the Fea of Muriel may have departed by necessity, but it departed in the will not to return. Therein was her fault. For this will was not under compulsion irresistible. It was a failure in hope by the Fea, acceptance of the weariness and weakness of the body as a thing beyond healing, and which therefore was not healed. But this resolve entailed not only abandoning her own life, but also the desertion of her spouse and the marring of his, of his life, that is. The child, however great, nor indeed by the gift of many children, the union of marriage is not ended, having further purpose. For one thing, Feonara will be deprived of the mother's part in his nurture. Moreover, if she would return, she need bear no more, unless by the renewal of rebirth her weariness were healed." 
Okay, so let's pause for a second. Um, before we get into the, um, before we get into the details of what he's saying about Muriel's case here, I want to make sure that we uh, remember the very important terms that he's referring to. And this is from the Manway's kind of preamble speech that he made that we looked at uh, the week before the, our last week, a little more than a month ago. Um, so. First, though, even before we look at that, herein I perceive not only the direct will of Eru, but fault in his creatures. Not guilt. Fault, but not guilt. So that, I think, is an important distinction here. Um, fault, but not... So he is not necessarily saying that they're guilty, that they're wrong, but they are at fault. This is an interesting and I think a very important distinction, right? Um, there is fault, but not necessarily guilt. And here again, he's relying on Manway's categories. There is bad decisions, right, which have to be rectified by justice. But justice itself is not the highest course, remember. Justice is a sort of middle way. It's sort of a minimum standard. But there is a, p a path that is above justice. And that is the path of hope, which leads to healing. Hope and healing are the high road. But, Manway said, those are very difficult. And you can't compel anybody to do that. Olmo's going to come back to this, too. You can't compel anybody to do that. And if someone who turns back from that higher path is not guilty like somebody who does wrong, right, who commits an act of injustice, right, that is, that is, that is unjust, that is wrong, that there, there is guilt attached to that. But you can be at fault without being guilty. The fault is in not taking the high road. Yeah, failing from the highest, which is the hope of which the king has spoken. Manway has spoken. Right? Um, see, I, I don't... So, David and uh, Mary both are suggesting... Um, it, David says perhaps faulty rather than at fault, and, and Mary was thinking about flawed uh, instead of guilty. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, it's sort of, maybe, yes, but, 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 but I tend to think not. He's not saying they can't help it. He's not saying this is, a, this is a, 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 like a problem that's intrinsic to their makeup, and so therefore they're not guilty. Um, he's saying they have made choices, and their choices, there is fault in their choices. They have chosen not to take the highest road. That is a failing. On their part, there is some you can say should about their choices. They should have done better. They should have done something else. They have failed, of take, but they haven't done wrong either. It's not just a binary situation. That is I, one of the first important things that I think that Olmo is is saying here. Right. Um, that you can have an, that, that it's actions are not binary. They're not either right or wrong. There is, and again, this is really crude, but the system that Manway had set up basically means there's wrong choices. There's choices which are okay, which are, are, are just, but still suboptimal. Um, and then there's the highest choice. But the highest choices are harder, and not everybody does that. Not, any, not everybody necessarily can do that. Um, and it's not wrong. You're not guilty if you don't go that route. But um, but it's still a failing. There is still fault here. Again, not built into them fault, but still a, their, their choice is still was not the best. They still made it a, a choice that isn't the best choice there. Exactly, uh, James Leback. There is choice involved, and I think that that's really, uh, that's really what's uh, what's in, what's important there. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 
um, so let's look at, um, right. So he says, I doubt not that the taking of the higher road on ascent that though hard was not impossible. So again, it's not just, it's, they, it's, it's not about the intrinsic parameters of their like apparatus, right? Um, it was possible, but difficult. It would have been difficult for them to take the higher road. Um, so Nana spoke of some immediate good that could come from the situation. Well, that's the good, right? Again, think way back to Iluvatar speaking to Melkor after the music and talking about how um, even... Uh, the discord, even, you know, all, all of the things that uh, Melkor will try to do will only redound to the greater glory, you know, only, you know, uh, great, uh, great beauty that he, you know, uh, that he hasn't anticipated will result from that. Um, this is one of the things that Olmo points to, right? These situations which arise as a result of the marring make the ascent to the higher road possible. It's difficult, but possible. And that in itself might be one of those, um, one of those things that where one of the ways in which good can come, uh, of, of evil. Um, okay. So down to cases, he'll talk about Muriel first, and then he'll talk about Finway second. The fair of Muriel may have departed by necessity. So he says, uh, and here he's addressing Aule's comment at the very beginning, right? Aule said, look, it's not her fault. This was essentially mandated by, by Iluvatar, right? If Iluvatar gave her a child whose soul she couldn't handle, essentially, right? I mean, if, if, if the, 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 the fear of this, of the child that was, you know, foisted upon her by Iluvatar did her in, how is that her fault, right? How is that a marring situation, Right. This seems to be a situation brought about by Iluvatar. And so therefore we maybe we need to recontextualize this. Um, uh, so he says, Olmo again, the fail of Muriel may have departed by necessity, but it departed in the will not to return. Again, you see the. The sort of the middle ground here, I'm not saying she did something wrong. Right. And yet she did not take the highest road, the highest road. Hope, which leads to healing, would have been to say, despite my weariness, despite all of these reasons which are, in fact, leading me to yield up the life here, um, despite that, I'm going to I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I'm going to achieve healing and have another go. Right. I'm going to hold on to hope and not give up on hope. Right. Um, therein was her fault. Notice again, he's saying fault, not guilt. Therein was her fault. For this will was not under compulsion irresistible. This will. The will not to return, mind. Perhaps, almost leaving open the possibility that her death was irresistible. Maybe it was. Right? Maybe she couldn't help that at all. But, the choice to stay in Manos, the choice not to return... That is her will. And that's where the fault lies. Again, not guilt necessarily, but fault. It was a failure in hope by the Fea. Acceptance of the weariness and weakness of the body. Again, the weariness and the weakness themselves are not wherein her fault lay, right? But in accepting the weariness and weakness of the body as a thing beyond healing, that is a failure in hope, right? And which therefore was not healed. The fact that her spirit was not healed, hasn't been healed, is a consequence of her choice, of her denial of hope. But this resolve entailed not only abandoning, and then he begins to look at the consequences, right? What are some of the outcomes of her action? Those things which uh, Nienna was just saying, the Eldar very often can't predict, right? Aren't very good at perceiving. Well, Olmo lays some of that out, right? They entailed not only abandoning her own life, but the desertion of her spouse and the marring of his life, right? 
Uh, the child, however great, nor indeed by the gift of many children, the union of marriage is not ended having further purpose. Like that, that more could have to, Muriel. There was more for her to do. There was more for her to achieve. Had she chosen the higher, harder road, she could have. Uh, there are other results that could have been brought about. There's there's other good that she could have that which she turned away from by not taking that higher road again. Not guilt, but fault. For one thing, Thanar will be deprived of his mother's part in nurture. Moreover, if she would return, she need bear no more. So he's saying, look, she, she doesn't necessarily have to have more kids, right? Um, her going back to life doesn't necessarily mean that she's got to sign herself up for more of the same, right? Of that same what led to the weariness and weakness of the body. She can overcome that. Um, so thus Muriel Finway, his assessment of Finway thus Finway was aggrieved and claimed justice so now let's look at Finway's choices Finway chose he was aggrieved and he claimed justice but when he called her and she did not return in only a few years he fell into despair herein lay his fault and failing in hope. Finway also did not take the high and hard path. Finway could have done. He didn't. Just as Muriel had a choice that was would have been very difficult for her, but she didn't take it, right? And greater good would have come had she taken it. So Finway had a choice that was open to him, and he didn't take it. And the, what they both have in common is a failure in hope. Herein lay his fault in failing in hope. But also he founded his claim, his claim for justice, mainly upon his desire for children, considering his own self and his loss more than the griefs that had befallen his wife. And that was a failing in full love. Let's keep going because he, he's going to carry on talking about this. The fair of the Eldar, as Nienna hath said, cannot be broken or forced, and the motion of their will cannot therefore be predicted with certainty. Yet it seemeth to me that there was hope still that after repose in Mandos, the Fea of Muriel should return of itself to its nature, which is to desire to inhabit a body. Yes, Muriel wasn't coming back. She was not, definitely not feeling like coming back. But Omo is reminding everybody, it's not been that long. It's only been a hundred years of the sun for crying out like the blink of the eye, right? Um, maybe if more time passed, her heart would change. Her will would change. And Finway didn't give her the chance to change, didn't give her the chance to be healed first and then maybe choose differently, right? It seemeth to me that there was hope, still, that after repose in Mandos, the Thea of Muriel would return of itself to its nature, which is to desire to inhabit a body. Remember that the the Thea which chooses to not be connected to Ahroa is making, in a sense, an unnatural choice, right? A, a choice which is unnatural to the way in which, the state in which uh, the spirits of elves were created. This strange event should issue rather than in dissolving their union, in the use by Finway of the patience of full love and the learning of hope, and in the return of Muriel, wider in mind and renewed in body. Finway had a choice. He's not saying it would have been easy. He's not rejecting Nienna's comments that, like, you know, when remember when Nienna was just saying, like, have you experienced, you know, the, uh, the loss of Finway? Um, can you relate to that? If not, how can we judge it? And he's like, no, I, I, um, I give that credit. Yes, it would have been really hard for Finway to do that. that. That's that's why it's the high road. That's why it's the difficult road, right? But if he had, it was also an opportunity to use the patience of full love, right? He had an opportunity there, which would have been difficult and it would have been painful. But even in doing that, he would have learned hope. Um, healing and hope 
are intimately connected on this high road, right, that Manway had described earlier on. Um, Thus together, they might foster their great son with joined love and his right nurture be assured. So here's Omo giving us a what if. What if? What if Feanor's two parents had not failed in hope? What if both of them had taken the high road? What if Muriel had taken the high road, accepted healing, and gone back to life? And meanwhile, Finway had taken the high road of patience, right? Um, and extended more time, rather than putting a, an early deadline on his wife's binding decision, uh, right, to remain, uh, and instead, uh, and instead of focusing on his own, uh, his own grievance, right? his own loss, uh, his own sorrow, focus instead more on his wife in the patience of pure love. What if they had both taken those higher roads? And the result, which of course, as Olmo says, they can't predict perfectly, but what the result would have been, might have been, two parents for Feanor who had both, who had strong hope, right? Um, imagine the strength of their relationship together and the strength of character and the kind of nurture that those two parents could have offered to Feanor, right? And that is a very striking thought, a very striking piece of context for Feanor. It's almost like Tolkien himself is thinking about the beating of the Feanor Pinata, <laughs> to use the term uh, of our friends at the Prancing Pony podcast, uh, and was wanting us to remember that Feanor's fall is not inevitable. There is a scenario in which, possibly multiple scenarios, in which Feanor does not fall and fulfills his calling, the position which Aule perceives right? Um, the great good that could have, might be, should have been done. Um, and here is a scenario in which that might have, might have happened, right? And I agree, Chris, it does contribute to the tragedy of the fall of Feanor. And I don't know about you, but it certainly makes it easier for me uh, to weep with Manway at the marring of Feanor when he falls, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Stephen says it's like uh, Tolkien wants us to feel pity for Fanor. Yeah, almost like that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Nienna sure does, and it seems that L.A. does too. But anyway, let's, um, let's keep going. I stopped in the middle of the paragraph here. But the Fea of Muriel hath not been left in peace, and by importuning, its will hath been hardened. Okay, he's still talking about uh, he's still talking about Finway here, the results of Finway's choice. It ha maybe if she had been left in peace, she might still have made the better choice, right? But he didn't give her the chance. By importuning, its will hath been hardened. Because Finway is out there demanding. All right, hon, make a choice, right? In or out of this marriage, right? Deadline time. That has hardened the will of Mirio. And in that resolve, it must remain without change while Arda lasteth if the statute is declared. Remember, this is the debate of whether or not to declare the statute as law. Thus, the impatience of Finway will close the door of life upon the fea of his spouse. This is the greater fault. Oh, so of the two of them, both have fault, right? But he is blaming, uh, blaming Finway more. This is the greater fault, for it is more unnatural that one of the Eldar should remain forever as Fea without body than that one should remain alive, wedded, but bereaved. Of the two failures of hope, his was the more severe. Or perhaps to um, 
or perhaps the more consequential, right? He he is choosing because he chose. He had a choice. Finway had a choice. And what he was choosing between, in almost terms here, either he remains alive, unwedded, but, but bereaved, either continuing throughout his life as a widower, or to make Muriel choose to live without a body. And there is a level on which what Finway is saying, I would rather you not get a body again, agree to not get a body again, than that I remain unwedded. Um, there's, there is selfishness there, right? Um, and uh, that, is, that is a fault and a greater fault than Muriel's, as he says uh, explicitly. Um, hmm, interesting. David says, uh, by importuning its will hath been hardened. Um, David is wondering if that could... So there, there are two different things. The importuning. Um, there are two different things that could be that that could be connected to. On the one hand, it could be his appeal to Manway for justice, right? Um, his basically request for the posthumous divorce, or it could even be could it be referring to his importuning of her spirit, like his lamentation, his attendance at her body, right? Um, uh, his calling out to Muriel. By her names, um, is that the importuning that is being referred to here, or is it only the petition for justice uh, that uh, almost talking about here? And I wonder, David. I'm not sure. Um, I tend to think. I tend to think that it must be the appeal for justice that um, almost referring to here, because I can't imagine. That Olmo, even though he's being, you know, doing some impassionate, in some um, dispassionate, that's the word I meant, some dispassionate judgment here of the case, that even he would be so not only dispassionate, but like anti-passionate, that he would accuse Finway as a fault for feeling grief and bereavement at all. Right. I, that doesn't seem to be where he's situating the fault. Um, he's not wrong. It's not a fault for him to feel grief at her death or to long for her to return or even for him to long for continued marriage and more children. That's not wrong. What's wrong is for what is a fault is for him to appeal for justice, to say, can we make a ruling and can you free me up to marry again? Um, that's where he is choosing himself over Muriel, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Brian is was arguing that, too. Um, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Brian, as you say, the ex any, you know, we don't have any evidence that uh, Finway's visits and personal importunings, whether they had an effect we can imagine that that could, I mean, I can imagine that that could be, I don't think it's impossible that that's what Olmo is, Olmo is referring to here. I can, I can imagine it being possible that, um, him begging her to return at this, like when she is still yet unhealed in spirit, um, could harden her will not to return. Right. Okay, no, I can't look, no, honey, I just can't. There's no way. Um, and firm up her resolve to not return like this. I, I, it's, I, I can imagine that, but I can't imagine that as being part of the fault. That's where I fall short here. Do you see what I mean? Um, I don't think that's an impossible reading, but I think that it's very, it seems to me very unlikely that Olmo is condemning him for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and you're right, Cecilia, that the dead can't talk to the living and the living can't talk to the dead. So I, I think you're right that based on what we've read before, it probably would be right for us to say that Muriel probably can't hear him, is probably unaware his, of his personal importunings. That seems likely. Um, 
That does seem likely. Uh, yeah. 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 I, 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 Kit points out that Finway is, of course, modeling selfishness for his son, which is, yeah, it's kind of true. It's kind of true. And of course, Kit, as we know, Fanor resents it. Um, we know that it has a negative impact on Fanor, right? Um, and it is it is the seed for many things uh, to follow. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, as Florian says, if Finway truly loved Muriel, remarrying shouldn't fully heal his bereavement either. You can't just replace a spouse you're meant to be with forever. Um, and Feanor will still miss his mother. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the impact on Feanor, we, we know what the impact on Feanor, well, we know some anyway, of what the impact on Feanor is going to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I do think, I do think, I do agree with uh, Cecilia, that the total isolation of spirits in Mandos, which was already explained earlier on, um, probably does... That sounds to me like the best possible argument uh, that Olmo is not referring to the ex the mere expressions of, of Fanor's... of Fanor's... of Finway's grief earlier on. Um... And instead referring only to the appeal by justice, the use of Manway as an intermediary between him and Muriel, essentially, as that's the only way that they communicate uh, afterwards. Um, okay, let's keep going. Then Vire speaks up as a character witness. Nay, said Vire suddenly, the Thea of Muriel is with me. I know it well, for it is small, but it is strong, proud, and obdurate. First of all, Note on it is small. I don't think Vire is insulting Muriel here. Um, remember that this is, um, you know, Muriel is possibly, uh, she's one of the first, right? There are not a whole lot of, uh, of, of Fear in Mandos right now, right? Um, and I take for it is small to be a reference back to what Nienna said before about the smallness and obdurateness of the, uh, I mean, she uses the word obdurate again in that same sentence, uh, the smallness and the obdurateness of the, uh, of the fea of, uh, you know, one of the Eldar. Um, she, when she says, I know it well for it is small. She doesn't mean like, since she is such a petty person, you know, I know her inside and out. She's saying, C compared to the Valar, like the Fear of the Eldar are small. Like I, um, you know, I've only gotten to know her over the last, you know, 10 years of the, of the trees, but, um, you know, it's been enough for me to get to, to get to know her pretty well. Right. I can tell you about the Fear of Muriel. It is strong, proud, and obdurate. It is of that sort who, having said this, I will do make their words a doom irrevocable unto themselves. She will not return to life or to Finway, even if he waiteth until the aging of the world. Of this he is aware, I deem, as his words show, for he did not found his claim on his desire for children only, but said to the king, My heart warns me that Muriel will not return while Arda lasts. Of what sort the knowledge or belief may be that he would thus express, and whence it came to him I know not. But Fea perceiveth Fea, and knoweth the disposition of the other in marriage especially, in ways that we cannot fully understand. We cannot probe all the mystery of the children of the nature of the children. But if we dare to speak of justice, then Finway's belief must be taken into account. And if, as I judge, it is well founded, not a fantasy of his own inconstancy, but against his will and desire, we must otherwise assess the faults of these two. When one of the queens of the Valar, Varda, or Yervana, or even I, departeth forever from Arda, and leaveth her spouse, will he or nil he, then let that spouse judge Finway, if he will, remembering that Finway cannot follow Muriel without doing wrong to his nature, nor without forsaking the duty and bond of his fatherhood. So Vire speaks up on Finway's behalf here, right? Um, now, what she's, she's not necessarily disagreeing with Olmo's entire statement, right? His premise uh, that there is fault 
on both sides. But Olmo deemed that the greater fault was on Finway's side, that ultimately his appeal was selfish. Was, But though, remember, he's not said guilty, faulty, right? Failing in perfect love, failing in the patience of hope. He had an opportunity to show higher love. He didn't show higher love. Um, Vire disagrees, not, I think, with his whole framework, but with his assessment of Finway and of Finway's choice. She says, there's a factor, Olmo, that you're forgetting, and that is Finway's insight that Muriel was not going to return. He didn't just get impatient. He felt the conviction that she was definitely not going to return. One of the things that Vire is questioning, Olmo has suggested, and the, the specific thing that Vire appears to be responding to here, is that he suggested that the greater fault lies with Finway in part because it's likely that his choice affected, effected her choice. Not just affected it, but might have helped to bring it about. Maybe she would have chosen differently, remember? If she were left alone longer, if he had been more patient. But by pushing her through his importunity to make a decision now, he has caused, helped to cause her decision to not return, to violate her own nature, right? Um, to commit, to commit, recommit? No, commit. Her fault, right? Her failure in hope. Um, that he might be partially responsible for that through his own choice. And she says, no, no, I think it might be the other way around. I think it might well be. Yes, he, he is at fault in failing in perfect patience. But you know what? She might, her choice might have caused that. Um, if he knew her well enough to know, if he had some kind of insight, which notice they're talking about mysteries there. If he had some kind of foresight which she leaves, Vire leaves open to a possibility here, right? That he might have known, or at the very least he believed, that there was no way. Be howsoever patient he should be, there is no way that she was going to make a different choice and come back. And so knowing that, that knowledge, that knowledge of her future choice, that insight into her future choice, uh, was part of what led to his own choice. And so, again, I don't think she's necessarily disagreeing that there's fault on both sides, that both of them have failed of taking that higher path. But she says there is a scenario here in which the heavier fault lies on her, actually. Um, that the pride and obdurate obduracy... Uh, of her, is that the noun form? What's the noun form of obdurate? Ob obduracy? Is there one? Anyway, um, let's just stick with pride. That her pride uh, 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 is um, what ultimately uh, caused uh, things instead. Um, yeah, Kit says, and Muriel is modeling obduracy for Feanor, which is also a factor in his fall. Yes, exactly. Uh, so he's getting uh, Kit entitlement from his dad and obduracy from his mom. Yeah, yeah. That is a bit of a double whammy, right, in the nurture of Feanor, which uh, certainly does seem to have uh, impact later on. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, David, I have no idea. David Erbach is asking, I would love to know if Tolkien got anyone else's input when working through this complex debate. Um, it, was this just him in conversation with himself? Or do you think he'd ask Edith her opinion, considering this is a debate concerning marriage? I don't know. Uh, or his priest? I don't know. Um, uh, you know, were there uh, were there any Inklings discussions? Who knows, right? Uh, uh, or, you know, uh, private discussions with... Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. Um, 
Matt says, man, I'm sure glad the Valor aren't responsible for judging my fate. Their lack of omniscience is sure shining through here. Yes. Uh, and that, of course, is one really interesting and significant thing about this passage, right? Because Vire is wrong. And we will see that Vire is wrong about Muriel, right? And that is, to me, the most mind-blowing turn of the entire Muriel and Finway situation. Um, well, let's keep going. Manway then comes in. So here's Manway's summing up, right? His uh, sort of final adjudication. When Vire had spoken, the Valar sat long in silence, until at length Manway spoke again. There is reason and wisdom in all that has been said. Truly, in the matter of the children we approach mysteries, and the key to their full understanding was not given to us. In part the children are indeed one, or maybe the chief, of those new things of which Aule hath spoken. Remember the new things that would come into the world that were not in the music that the uh, that therefore the Valar won't understand? He says, the children are definitely one of those things. They might even be the greatest of those things. Yet they came into Arda Mard and were destined to do so and to endure the marring even though they came in their beginning from beyond Ea. Now here's a really important principle that Manway has observed here, right? The children of Iluvatar have been introduced into the world. They've been introduced into Arda by Iluvatar. And guess what? He knew that it was marred when he introduced them, right? He didn't introduce them into a perfect world, which might have remained perfect, but didn't. He introduced them into a world already marred. And therefore, the marring is part of the formula part of Iluvatar's formula. They came into Artemard and were destined to do so and to endure the marring, even though they came in their beginning from beyond Ea. For these new things, manifesting the finger of Iluvatar, as we say, they may have no past in Arda and be unpredictable before they appear, yet they have thereafter future operations which may be predicted, according to wisdom and knowledge, since they become at once part of Ea and part of the past of all that followeth. That, I think, is Manway saying, agreeing with Olmo, in a sense, that um, we can make judgments about this. Yes, there are going to be many things about the children that we don't understand. But that doesn't mean that we should just be like, yeah, no, boy, we got nothing about the children. Like, it's, children are out of our jurisdiction, right? Because this is just an Iluvatar business, so let Iluvatar take care of it. No, they come into Arda. And when they come into Arda, they come into our jurisdiction. And we can understand. Not perfectly, right? We'll never understand the children perfectly because th there are mysteries here, right? There are things that are beyond our comprehension. There are things that are beyond the knowledge that we have been given. But... They're operating in Arda now, and we do understand Arda, and we can see where things are going. We can judge, not perfectly, but we can make judgments about the outcomes of events. And so they are in our jurisdiction, and we do, even if we don't understand it perfectly, we do have the ability uh, and even the duty, right, to be making judgments about that. Um, okay. Uh, so let's see, where were we? Uh, future operations. Okay. We may say, therefore, that the elves are destined to know death in their mode, being sent into a world which contains death and having a form for which death is possible. So he's going back to the early stages of the debate. What about death? Right. Um, if. Remember, Aule was saying, like, she just because she died doesn't necessarily mean that that's proof of the marring, right? I mean, if it came from a Luvatar, that means it's not part of the marring, and Manway's like, mm, yes and no. Elves are destined to know death in their mode, being sent into a world which contains death, and having a form for which death is possible. For though by their prime nature unmarred, they rightly dwell as spirit and body coherent. Yet the, these are two things, the spirit and body, not the same. And their severance, which is death, is a possibility inherent 
in their union. Death, the concept of death, the possibility of death does not come from Melkor. It comes from the very nature of the elves. The elves being a composite of spirit and body with the possibility of the severance of those two. Since it is possible for them to have their bodies and their spirits divided by their na- by the nature, by the way that they've been designed by Iluvatar, death is part of the potential for them, right? It's a possibility inherent in the Union. But he could have done it differently. Iluvatar could have designed this Fea and the Hroa of elves such that they were indissoluble, so that death was not possible. He did not design them that way. And so, therefore, death is part of the system that Iluvatar invented for the elves. He sent them into Arda, which was already marred at the time, and he knew that it was marred at the time when he did it, right? And the possibility of death is therefore not an evil in itself. It is part of his design. Aule and Niena err, I deem. For what each saith in different words meaneth this much, that death which cometh from the marrer may be one thing, and death as an instrument of Eru be another thing, and discernible. You can tell the difference between a, a marred death and an unmarred death. The one being of malice, and therefore only evil and inevitably grievous. The other being of benevolence, intending particular and immediate good and therefore not evil, and either not grievous or easily and swiftly to be healed. So there's like happy death and there's sad death. If it's a sad death, it's a marred death, right? But if it's a death which comes from a Luvatar, it's a good death, right? It's a good thing. It's a benevolent thing. So you've got death which comes from benevolence, and you've got death which comes from malice, and so you can totally tell the difference, right? For the evil and the grief of death are in the mere severance and breach of nature which is alike in both, or death is not their name, and both occur only in Arda Mard and, in accor- and accord with its processes. All death is grievous. All children of Iluvatar have been formed with the possibility of death. Death is on the table for everybody. That's how Iluvatar made them. It is not violence that has been done to them that makes death possible. And yet, all death, whatsoever the cause, right? How, you know, high the rating is on the morrow meter, right? When they die, it's still grievous because the severance of the spirit in the body of elves, that's not how it's supposed to be. That is against the nature of the elves. So, Manwe says, Iluvatar has created a situation, on purpose created a situation, in which the severance of the mind and body is possible, but it's unnatural, and it's always grievous. Why would he do that? Why would Iluvatar do that? If he didn't, if he was anti-death, Again, if it's a violation of the nature of the elves, if it's always grievous for the children to die, why would he make it an intrinsic part of their system? But if he were pro-death, right? If death were part of his plan, then why would it be fundamentally unnatural and always grievous for them to die? But that paradox is what Manwe insists on. It is both natural and unnatural in different senses. Natural in the sense that it is part of the system that Iluvatar has made. He has made them subject to death. But it's also unnatural in the sense that it's not... So what he has done by Man, by Manway's argument here, what Manway has done is make the Eldar vulnerable to this unnatural state. But it is good for them not 
to be that it is good for them not to die, but it is always possible for them to die. In other words, what he has done is preserved that situation of choice. He has placed them in a system where it's inevitable that there are going to be difficult choices. Hope and patience are going to be required of them. They are going to be pushed to make those that choice, that hard choice of the higher ground, right, of the higher path. But it's going to be hard. There's, it's going to be grievous. Um, yeah, Stephen, you're right. Melkor's discord was both an ugly aberration and a component of the beautiful theme. Yes, and we can see that, I think. I think that the way that Manway is articulating this I think that we can see Tolkien embodying that doctrine. On the one hand, that statement that Iluvatar makes in the Aina Lindale, it's deep, it's profound, it's beautiful, but it's kind of easy to say, right? You can say from its, you know, uh, uh, all that you do will redound to my glory, right? But what does that mean? Like, on the ground, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, how can we see that? It's one thing to just sort of state that as a principle, right? But it's another thing to help us to, like, understand what that looks like. And here, I think we see Tolkien, through Manway, beginning to do that. Um Yeah. Um, let's keep going. Manway has more to say. Therefore I deem that Olmo is to be followed rather, holding that Eru need not and would not desire as a special instrument of his benevolence a thing that is evil. Death is not evil. Right? Um, wherefore indeed should he intrude death as a new thing into a world that suffereth it already? Nonetheless, Eru is lord of all, and will use as instruments of his final purposes, which are good, whatsoever any of his creatures, great or small, do or devise, in his despite or in his service. Right? So again, he's repeating that doctrine that I've just been referring back to. Right? No matter what choices his creatures make, whether they make excellent choices, whether they make okay choices, whether they make bad choices... Right, whichever choices they make, Eru is Lord of all, and he's going to use every single one of those choices as instruments of his final purposes, which are good. But we must hold that it is his will that those of the Eldar who serve him should not be cast down by griefs or evils that they encounter in Arda Mard, but should ascend to a strength and wisdom that they would not otherwise have achieved, that the children of Eru should grow to be daughters and sons. They should ascend to a strength and wisdom that they would not otherwise have achieved. What is the good that can be achieved? Not just in some kind of vague, big-picture sense, right? That in some sense good is... So it's this is not to say that, you know... Thing, because evil exists, stuff is going to suck for some people, but, you know, big picture, it's going to work out okay, right? Um, you know, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That is not the doctrine of Manwe and of Iluvatar here, right? Um, the evils, there are going to be, that because Arda is marred, because of the discord of Melkor, those who serve him should not be cast down by griefs or evils that they encounter in Artemar. They're going to encounter griefs and evils. Bad stuff is going to happen, right? What is the consequence of the bad things happening to them, right? What is the consequence? Why should bad things happen to good people? Why should Iluvatar permit bad things to happen to good people? 
because it is only through the encountering of griefs and evils that they will have the opportunity to ascend to a strength and wisdom that they would not otherwise have achieved. That choice of the higher route. If there is no evil, there's no need for hope. And that hope is the high road, which brings them to a place that they would not have been, that they could not have attained without the evils that they encounter. And as a consequence, those who take that higher road should grow to be daughters and sons. Good will come not only through them, but for them as well. For Arda Unmarred hath two aspects or senses. The first is the unmarred that they discern in the marred, if their eyes are not dimmed, and yearn for, as we yearn for the will of Eru. This is the ground upon which hope is built. The second is the unmarred that shall be, that is, to speak according to time in which they have their being, the Arda healed, which shall be greater and more fair than the first, because of the marring. This is the hope that sustaineth. It cometh not only from the yearning for the will of Iluvatar the begetter, which by itself may lead those within time to know more than regret, but also from trust in Eru the Lord everlasting that he is good, and that his works shall all end in good. This the marrer hath denied, and in his denial is the root of all evil, and its end is in despair. Okay, Arda Unmarred hath two aspects or senses. There is hope which is founded in what should be. When you look around yourself and say, this is wrong, Arda is marred, it shouldn't be like this, right? And you have a picture, as we've seen, uh, as we've seen, the picture, uh, this we've seen this in several of what the Valar have said earlier in the debate, right? They can all kind of imagine, um, they can all kind of imagine what Arda Unmarred would look like, right? Um, and they were doing like what ifs before, right? Um, like if Arda weren't marred, would Muriel have died? And right, you know, like death, you know, death shouldn't happen in Arda Unmarred and whatever. Um, that's a theoretical Arda unmarred. That doesn't exist, right? Um, but that's the first, that is uh, the ground upon which hope is built. We yearn for that as we yearn for the will of Eru. It is a perception. It's not just an imagination, right? It is a perception of what Eru's will is, even though that will is imperfectly manifested in the world around us. The world around us is marred, right? But um, even in it, we can perceive. Even in perceiving the marring and recognizing it, acknowledging it as marred, we are acknowledging the unmarred. We are perceiving that which is unmarred, right? And that is the ground of hope. But it's not enough for hope. Because, as he said, it could lead just to regret. It could lead only to bitterness. To be saying, yeah, well, wouldn't it be great if Arda were unmarred, right? I can see, believe me, I've got a list of improvements for Arda right here, right? Um, and the longer that list of, improve, of theoretical improvements gets, like, the more bitter I get about how Arda actually is, right? So that, but that, so that first grounding of hope, that perception of like the sort of theoretical Arda unmarred is not enough for hope. The knowledge of Arda healed, right? The second aspect of Arda unmarred is the unmarred that shall be. The Arda healed which shall be greater and more fair than the first because of the marring. This is the hope that sustaineth. It's good to yearn for the will of Iluvatar the Begetter, to say what if, to say should have. 
but that needs to be added to trust in Eru, the Lord everlasting. To supplement should have been with will be. And if you have both of those things, that is hope. That is the Estelle, the high hope, which is the high but hard path. It is really hard to pursue that path in the context of Arda Mard, which is the context that we have. Um, I agree, Brian, all of Iluvatar's children should read Boethius. It's all in Boethius. Um, yes, yes. And so evil shall be good to have been, Josiah. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, Ah, so David Atley says, I'm having an uncomfortably difficult time thinking of elves who encountered evils and grew to wisdom and greatness as a result. Uh, Galadriel? Two problems here, David. Problem number one is that... Uh, okay, three. Three. Three problems. <laughs> one problem from outside the story, two from within it. The problem from outside the story is that, of course, I wonder, David how many of the stories of the Silmarillion might be different if Tolkien had done this thinking first? If this stuff had emerged from Tolkien's mind in, you know, 1915 instead of in, you know, 1958 uh, or whenever exactly it is. Um, that's one thing that I would say. Now, again, I am not shocked Right. I mean, it's easy to say, like, oh, boy, if only he had been at wi as wise at the age of 20 as he was at the age of 60, then, you know, things would have been different. Well, yeah, but, you know, if we can all say that, can't we? Um, but um, so that's 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 one thing, uh, David, that I would say about that. But, but for, even from within the context of the story, there are two other things. One is that. Remember the um, the Hobbit chapter three principle. Um, you know, it is a strange fact that times that are good to spend and uh, uh, and things that are good to have don't make a very good story. Um, the bad choices that people make make for the sensational stories that tend to get told. Uh, somebody who gains in wisdom and, uh, you know, achieves uh, goodness and quietude might not have a story that goes into the Chronicles in the same way as someone who uh, his entire life is a fantastic display of bad choices and uh, tragedy one after the other. Not naming any names there. Um, but, but anyway, so that's uh, there's there's um, I, that that's that that's the second thing, uh, David, that I'd say about that. The third thing that I would say about that is. Don't forget that all the stories that we get stop at their death at the latest, right? And, of course, the whole story of the life of the Eldar within Arda isn't complete. Um, it may well be, David, that some of the elves who encounter evils, their growth to wisdom and greatness is yet to come, right? Um, it may be that what... Fingolfin encounters and experiences in his life are only going to he is only going to achieve the full wisdom and greatness to which the Fea of uh, of Fingolfin is going to grow after he goes to Mandos. So and we don't know the rest of that story, right? So that's um that's another thing. Um yeah, now, there are examples, right? Christopher points to Elrond, which I think is a good one. I would even potentially point to Galadriel, I think, uh, gaining in wisdom and greatness. Um, I think that, you know, her passing the test and what comes at the end and her departure from Middle-earth are all things which point to an increase of greatness and wisdom on her part. Um, uh, and um, uh, Josiah... Or, Chris suggested Elrond, which I think is a good uh, uh, option. Josiah says perhaps uh, Luthien, Finrod, and maybe even Mithros could be candidates from the old stories. Um, Mithros, I think, is a really interesting one, Josiah, certainly as somebody who um, he's one of the biggest kind of before and after stories that we get. You know, somebody who encounters a great, you know, a great evil um, and even, you know, consequences of his own actions. Um, but 
uh, changes as a result. Not perfectly, right? But uh, but I do think that the trajectory of Mithros's character could illustrate at least the beginnings of that journey. And who knows? Um, who knows what greatness uh, Mithros's uh, Fea achieved? You know, after uh, his the death of his Roa there. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Florian suggests that Finarfin grew in wisdom when he turned back from the rebellion. That's possible. That's possible. Um, good. Cecilia nominates Maglor with his throwing away of the Silmaril. Potentially. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, Michael's thinking about Celebrimbor in his repudiation of his father. Uh, uh, and I would say also, therefore, sort of implicitly of his grandfather as well, um, though he was later deceived. Yeah. And you think of the tragedy of his later. But again, that, too, not the end of his story by any stretch. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyway. And Alyssa, of course, points to Glorfindel. Uh, and David was thinking about Glorfindel as well, potentially as the one example maybe that we get of this. Uh, the stature and greatness of Glorfindel. Glorfindel 2.0, Glorfindel returned to Middle-earth, um, is certainly, potentially, one of the most prominent examples of the only glimpse, really, that we get of the kind of greatness that uh, is possible to an elf who has been through as much as Glorfindel has, including death, right? Um Okay. All right. Deep stuff, Tolkien. Oh, but Manway is still not done. Therefore, notwithstanding the words of Vire, I abide by that which I said first. For though she speaketh not without knowledge, that is Vire, she uttereth opinion, not certainty. So she's giving her opinion of the state of Muriel's will. She doesn't know for a fact about the obduracy and immutability of Muriel's will about this. The Valar have not and must not presume certainty with regard to the wills of the children, nor even were they certain in this one case concerning uh, the Fea of Muriel, would that unmake the union of love that once was between her and her spouse, or render void the judgment that constancy to it would in Finway be a better and fairer course." more in accord with Arda Unmarred or with the will of Eru in permitting this thing to befall him. Notice how he acknowledges the pain that Finway is suffering. If you want to call it a Luvatar's fault, it's a Luvatar's fault, right? He allowed it. He allowed it. Nobody's trying to say, like, well, there's nothing Luvatar could have done, man. It was out of his hands, right? This was the, a result of the choices of people and the marring of Arda, right? You know, he's like, no. He knew this. And Luvatar permitted that to happen. He knew that was going to happen, and he let it happen, right? He put Finway in that situation. Why did he put Finway in that situation? So that he could choose the higher course, right? So that he could have here. He's agreeing with Olmo again, right? He gave him the opportunity for increase of hope, for perfection of love, and even if it were true, even if uh, Vire is correct. He's like, given for a second that we could know for a fact, we can't, but given that, even if you imagine that we could know for a 100% fact that Muriel is never going to change her mind, that Muriel um, is, uh, is, is definitely never coming back, that doesn't mean that what almost said about Finway's fault is wrong. It wouldn't unmake the union of love that once was between her and her spouse or render void the judgment that constancy to it would, in Finway, be a better and fairer course. Finway, by choosing to be remarried and to bring forth more children, was at fault. Not in guilt, but at fault. Constancy to his spouse would have been better a better and fairer course, more in accord with Arda Unmarred. And therefore, again, the hope thing, right? To do, to act in the way that is consistent, not with the pragmatic life within Arda Mard, but to act consistently to how things should be. 
that's the harder course, right? And it's not pleasant and it's not fair in a sense. Remember, it transcends justice. He can get justice and he is going to get justice. His remarriage is justice. But that's the lesser. Justice is not the highest thing. It's the lower road. Remember, that was Manway's premise from the beginning. You can get justice if you can settle for that, right? If you are content to settle for justice, you can have justice. But hope and healing is the higher road. Um, the statute openeth the liberty of a lower road, and accepting death countenanceth death and cannot heal it. Why is justice a lower road? In accepting death, it countenanceth death and cannot heal it. True healing can only come by that higher road, by hope, by the hope in Arda unmarred in both of its aspects, both the what should be, even if it isn't, and in the what shall be down the road, but isn't yet. If you hold to that, and it sucks, but if you hold to it, healing can come, can come in a way that will not come by the lower road. Because the lower road of justice accepts death and countenances it, and therefore can't heal it. If that liberty is used, if you go for the justice option instead of the higher, harder option, the evil of the death of Muriel will continue to have power and will bear fruit in sorrow. Remember, there's the path of perfection, there's the path of fault, and there's the path of guilt, right? The death, the, 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 it, they're at, he is at fault for taking the lower road. It's understandable. It's not bad. It's not wrong. But it will bear fruit in sorrow. The death of Muriel will continue to have power. The death of Muriel will not be healed. It will still remain a wound. An infection will come from it. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Josiah, you're, Josiah was saying, I know we, I, how much, I, I, he, said, I, he says, I don't know how much we want to delve into applicability. Not much. Uh, I'm not wanting to apply this to anything that's going on in any of our lives or in the lives of the country, but let me, I will just say with you, Josiah, that yes, I too have found these passages deeply applicable. Um, and there is, I think, much that we can learn from these things. At least I certainly find this, uh, uh, these passages very deeply moving in many ways myself. Um, but this matter I now commit to Namo the judge. Let him speak last. Okay. Um, It is interesting, David, thinking about, David is thinking about the idea of seeking justice for a wrong as being a fault. Um, seems like a bad way to organize a society, as he says. Yes, to some extent, that's certainly true. Uh, Manways, or Mandos is about to talk about that. Let's hang on to this, David, because Mandos is going to address exactly, on, when it comes to the question of organizing a society... Uh, Mandos agree. Justice is the principle upon which you organize a society. It is our part to rule Arda, Mandos says, and to counsel the children or to command them in things committed to our authority. Three things. They rule Arda. Arda is their responsibility. They counsel the children. They don't rule the children. Right? They advise the children. The children have to make their own choices. We rule Arda. We counsel the children or to command them in things committed to our authority. So what's the difference between counseling and commanding? They can only advise them. They can't rule them. They can't make them make the right choices. 
they can command them. They can say, you got to do this or we will inflict consequences upon you. So again, here, David, we're already getting into the question of organizing a society, right? We're going to pass rules and we're going to say there are some things that are not okay, right? The middle road is the suboptimal road, but it's, we're, we're, we're not going to just go along with the bottom road. You can make your own choice. We can't stop you making choices, right? You are free to make your own choices. We don't rule you, but we are going to make it clear that justice exists, right? And there are some things that are going to be wrong. You're going to be guilty if you choose those things. You're still free to do it, right? But there are going to be consequences if you do it, right? You can also choose that middle road of justice, in which case you're fine as far as we're concerned, right? But we're also going to counsel you that merely seeking justice isn't the, isn't the top road, right? Um, okay, therefore, it is our task to deal with Arda Mard and to declare what is just within it. We may indeed counsel, we may indeed in counsel point to the higher road, but we cannot compel any free creature to walk upon it. That leadeth to tyranny, which disfigureth good and maketh it seem hateful. Healing by final hope, as Manway hath spoken of it, is a law which one can give to oneself only. Of others, justice alone can be demanded. A ruler who discerning justice refuseth it to the sanction of law, demanding abnegation of rights and self-sacrifice, will not drive his subjects to these virtues, virtuous only if free, but by unnaturally making justice unlawful, will drive them rather to rebellion against all law. Not by such means will Arda be healed. So David, Mandos completely agrees with you. You can't organize a society on that basis. You can't say, okay, everybody, justice is passe, right? Forget justice, everybody. Everybody has to take this, uh, the high path of patience and healing and hope, right? You can't organize society that way. That is outside their power. It's not possible to do. It is only by free choice that those things can be. So their role as the administrators of society, their role is to make rules about justice, to define the middle road. Here's what justice looks like. Here are the things that are not okay. You can't do these things, and we can command that. You can make your own choice as to what you do, but we can command that you don't do that, right? But we can't command the higher path. We can advise, we can tell you about it. We can advise you to do it. So I think, David, that what Tolkien is saying is not that everybody should be, like, again, that we should, like, forget about justice, that justice isn't good as an organizational principle for society. It's, Mandos completely agrees. That's the only way society can be organized. But what I think that Manway is saying here, not here, in the previous slide, and what Mandos is affirming is that if everybody did, the more, or I forget everybody, if more people did choose that higher road, a better result than justice would come. If everybody adheres to justice, that's good. It's way better than chaos, right? It's way better than vice and malice. But it's not the highest thing. Sorrow will still come. Sorrow will still result. Just as sorrow will result in, as we're going to see in Feanor, right? From the choices that Muriel and Finway made. They, they, they weren't guilty. They didn't do wrong. But they didn't choose the higher path. And as a result, sorrow came. And tragedy was enabled, which might have been forestalled had they made better choices. And the same can be true in every case. It's not that justice is bad. And again, it's certainly not that justi justice is absolutely the standard by which society needs to be organized. But it's not the highest mode. Um, Yeah. And Stephen, you're right. Justice is necessary 
so long as anybody decides to go a different way. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Justice could only be abandoned if everybody, if there was 100% participation in the high and hard way of hope. And not only is that not going to happen, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it would only, it would only, it would only happen if that happened. Absolutely. Um, yes. Um, interesting. Yeah. Chris says this is written in the shadow of Sam Gamgee asking Galadriel for justice to pay people out for their dirty work. Um, her refusal and her gift to him of healing uh, in the form of his little box. That's a beautiful insight, Chris, uh, seeing that as an illustration here, right? Um, what comes about Sam's desire for justice is not met. Um, and remember Frodo uh, participating only in preventing the killing even of ruffians, right, in the scouring of the Shire. Mere just, did they deserve it? Yeah, probably, sure, right? Um, but as Gandalf said long before, you know, does he deserve death? I dare say, I dare say they do, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Mm, hang on a second, glancing ahead. Uh, okay, no, yeah, one more. One more and then we'll be done. Um, we won't, we didn't quite get to the shocking ending of the Finway and Muriel story, <laughs> which I find pretty shocking, uh, really. The greatest shock of all of the shocks that have been unfolded during the uh, blossoming of the uh, Finway and Muriel story. We'll end with this. Hearken now, O Valar, to me for, to still Mandos, right? To me foretelling is granted no less than doom. And I will proclaim now to you things both near and far. Behold, Indus the fair shall be made glad and fruitful, who might else have been solitary. For not in death only hath the shadow entered into Amon with the coming of the children destined to suffer. There are other sorrows, even if they be less. Long she hath loved Finwë in patience and without bitterness. Aule nameth Feanor the greatest of the Eldar, and in potency that is true. But I say unto you that the children of Indus shall also be great, and the tale of Arda more glorious because of their coming. And from them shall spring things so fair that no tears shall dim their beauty, in whose being the Valar and the kindreds of both elves and men that are to come shall all have part, and in whose deeds they shall rejoice. So that, long hence, when all that here is and seemeth yet fair and impregnable shall nonetheless have faded and passed away, the light of Amon shall not wholly cease among the free peoples of Arda until the end. When he that shall be called Eärendil setteth foot upon the shores of Amon, ye shall remember my words. In that hour ye will not say that the statute of justice hath borne fruit only in death, and the griefs that shall come ye shall weigh in the balance, and they shall not seem too heavy compared with the rising of the light when Valinor groweth dim. I don't know about you, but this passage gives me some serious chills. I don't know. Um, uh, thinking about this passage in the sense merely, which is not its only sense, or even perhaps its greatest sense, but in the sense of rounding out our discussion of justice and hope. Notice the final conclusion he puts on that. Justice is the lower path, right? Hope is the higher path. Justice is the lower path. Not the low path. It's the, it's the medium path, right? But it's lower than the high path. Um, and grief will come from it. If you are content with pursuing mere justice, grief will come from that. Sorrow shall come from that. Um, it, you will not achieve the full beauty of what could be achieved, right? Like that beautiful, shining, what if Theonor's two parents had made the different choices, the better choices. Things could have been amazing if that had happened, right? Instead, 
things were sorrowful, things were tragic. Does that mean that the will of Iluvatar was thwarted? Heck no. Even though people will pursue, many people, most people will pursue at best the course of justice, that lower path, that doesn't mean that goodness won't come. That goodness can only come, right, through the pursuit of the higher path. Yeah, sorrow and evils come as a result of the lower choices that people, the lower path choices that people make. But from those evils also emerge, emerges good. All of those things, whether they choose the high path or whether they choose the middle path or whether they choose the low path, Iluvatar is going to use that for good and bring good out of it. And Mandos gives them a glimpse of the good that is going to come of this, right? Notice how he gives both an immediate and a long-term good, right? Good can come. This is a this is this is a this is a lesser good that they have chosen. They are both at fault, sure. But good is going to come from it. Look, look at Indus. Good is going to come to Indus. There are other evils. Remember, we're talking about like the, you know they're, they're debating about like oh the death of Muriel is that like a you know is it because of the marring is it not because of the marring and he's like dude don't, why are you only thinking about death look at Indus look at Indus's not bereavement but look at her solitude. Look at her unrequited love. Remember how unrequited love was a puzzlement that the Valar didn't understand, right? Look at, th that's another evil, right? It's another result of Arda Mard. And guess what? One of the immediate consequences of Finway choosing the middle route, Finway and Muriel both choosing the middle route, is going to be Indus's happiness. Um, she has been choosing the good road. She has been loving Finway in patience and without bitterness. She could have chosen a different way, right? She's been making a good choice. Indus has. And she is going to receive, in the short term, joy as a result of this. So there's one example that you'll see very quickly is a positive result of this choice. But there are others. Arendel, you'll remember this when Arendel comes, and you will see that great good can come, even not despite the evils and the sorrow that comes, but as a consequence of the evil and sorrows that come as the result of these choices. Um, to quote a totally different Tolkien work, one of my favorite uh, Tolkien quotes. Things could have been different, but they couldn't have been better. Um, that is a statement in Leaf by Niggle about Providence uh, and how Providence incorporates all of our decisions. Um, and Mandos is pointing, I believe, to a very similar thing here. Okay. All right. That's it. That's it. I'm going to let you guys go. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will finish... The uh, uh, Finway and Muriel story come to the surprising twist at the end of the Finway and Muriel story uh, next time. And then, hey, maybe we'll move on uh, to some of the rest of uh, the later Quenta. Remember what we were talking about? We've been talking about this stuff in isolation for so long. Um, we'll have to remind ourselves of the, uh, uh, of the larger uh, <laughs> sort of revision context, right? Drafting context of all this stuff. Uh, but we'll get there uh, and we'll look at that and then move on uh, to later things after that. So thanks everybody. I will see you guys next week. Uh, and uh, yeah, next week next. So I, I should be, uh, just to warn you guys, I will be able to be here, I think for the next three weeks after this, I'll be missing one week in August, uh, in the middle of August, like the, the week of August 17th. So I think it's the 19th of August is the Wednesday. Um, that's uh, uh, so I'll be away then, but I should be here, I think, for the rest of August. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.